I just now, I just met him just now in the flesh, I've spoken to him before on, on, on the Zoom machine, and uh, it's very odd hearing his voice, because I'm so used to listening to his voice on his brilliant YouTube channel, Military History Visualised, in which he forensically pulls the wings off various Second World War daddy long legs, and, um, uh, you know, investigates things again, looks again at stuff. And we're, it's a real treat that he's joined us from Germany. Um, it's Germany, isn't it? Austria. Austria. <laughs> I mean, given the period we're talking about, what's the difference? What's <laughs> um, uh, uh, Napoleon was from Corsica. Um, the thing is, uh, so, he wasn't French either. Right, so what we're going to do, um, uh, please, uh, uh, we're gonna, they're, they're going to be talking about the best German generals. Ooh, that's a good one, isn't it? So please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Alex Ritchie and Ben Hubcutt. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, Malcolm. I don't know what to say, really. Except, uh, uh, I've been to Austria. Uh, nice place. <laughs> Austrian. Uh, there you go. <laughs> you know, it is a separate country. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. But for the era we're talking about, uh um, um, so we are, uh, we've been asked to talk about the best generals, and um, we decided to sit down and talk about it, and Bernard immediately said, what do you mean, best generals? First of all, this is a highly embarrassing subject when you're talking about the Nazi regime. I mean, really, what's best? Um, you know, do you mean good tactician, uh, strategy, uh, good planning? Um, you didn't kill too many of your own men, you killed lots of other men? I mean, you know, what, what is it? Uh, lack of criminality, highly decorated, highly effective. Um, there, these are the sorts of questions we were sort of arguing about and clearly came up with absolutely no answer. So um, we decided the first thing we'd do is try and figure out what that means. What, what, what are we talking about when we say the word best generals? And uh, I, I very cleverly decided to hand it over to Bernard and, 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 and <laughs> defer to my guest. <laughs> So basically, what the Germans do now, the pers perspective is Hürter did a, his study on the German uh, generals in beginning of Barbarossa till summer 1942. And he looked at what they talked about, what was most important, and he figured out about 90% what they talk in, in, the, in the official talks, but also in private letters and everything, was about tactical and operational aspects. So basically, he fo they focus mainly what for them is important is inflicting the most damage on the enemy while receiving the least amount of losses. Of course, if you look at German academics now, he basically also states that it's now completely different. They would basically rate them who was the least involved in war crimes. So you have this very different perspective of what the Germans, the generals at this time or officers would see as the most effective or most or best general, and now it is. So very different and some of you might know my video on best channels, and you probably ask, why is he doing this talk? Yeah, I like a challenge. Because <laughs> I have a very different approach. I generally, on my channel, focus not on names. I talk about the function. For instance, the, uh, the, the chief of the channel staff or the commander of this division. I usually don't mention the names for a very good reason, information hiding. I want to keep the abstraction low. The other thing is, I like... Uh, a systems view, and Jens Wehner um, made me aware of this very well. You under have to understand the system Wehrmacht. So the best example probably is the Battle of Stalingrad. The commander of the Sixth Army, General Paulus, or infamous, was the head of the Sixth Army, and it was encircled at Stalingrad. Now many argue if it was a different general, he would have the balls or whatever to move out, to break out of the encirclement. Now, who was the second in command? The 1R, the operations officer of, of Paulus? He was a, well, he was a Nazi. So if Paulus went against the order from Hitler, probably would have been sacked and the other one guy took over. So this is one aspect of the system. Now one could argue, well, we don't know. Actually, we have a very good example here because in the Sixth Army, there was a corps under the command of General Seidlitz and he pulled back one infantry division. Now, Paulus got, uh, got the information about this, but he got it from Berlin, as far as I remember. Jens, you please correct me if I got something wrong. So how did this happen? 
So there was some Luftwaffe unit near this infantry division, and when the infantry division pulled back, they were not in direct contact with the Luftwaffe, and the Luftwaffe basically, the radio guys messaged and said, Wh what's going on? And that somehow arrived in Berlin before it arrived at Paulus. So you can actually see the whole system, how it works. And this is another point why I generally reject the point of the best channels, because I don't really look at the people, I try to look as a system. And maybe that's my, also my background, because I also studied computer science. And I basically said once on my channel, I try to figure out the important factors and systems because in a way I want to maybe simulate it or create a computer game. So you need to understand how everything works, the mechanisms, the cogs in the wheel. And for me, basically, a channel is a cog in the wheel. Of course, I know the systematic or the systems approach has certain limits, and sometimes the person is really important. And I think this is... Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think, that, I think that the old way of looking at the, you know, the sort of great man theory, and they're the only ones that matter, uh, and, and their personalities dominate everything, and then you've got the sort of famous, the Rommels, and, and so on. We all know those names. But I, I think that there's some um, generals who are perhaps less well known, but whose personalities and characters really also did have a huge impact on, on what they did and how they behaved in the, in the war, and, and make, that makes them great generals, but not for the reasons that, that are traditionally uh, put forward. And, and my example of that is, is General Blaskowitz. General Blaskowitz, who was uh, already in the military in World War I and in, Weimar, in the Weimar Republic State in the Reichswehr, and then commanded the Eighth Army on, on the, during the invasion of Poland. So from the outside, just seems to be absolutely card-carrying you know, Nazi. However, he was a little bit different because actually like a lot of uh, people in the Wehrmacht, um, quietly d sort of disdained Hitler as the sort of little corporal. And he um, actually believed in the separation of politics from the, from the army. Uh, a lot of Wehrmacht generals said that after the war and, 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 and pretended that they, they believed that too, but they didn't actually act accordingly. But Blaskowitz was different because when they, the Germans invaded Poland, as you all know, they brought in the Einsatzgruppen. and they were first invented in Austria, but they, sorry. Um, but then they, were, uh, uh, then they were brought into Poland and their first task was the, really the de decapitation of Polish intelligentsia in the so-called AB Aktion. So they went around you know, with these lists of people that they wanted to arrest and, and very often and shoot and kill. And Blaskowitz saw this and was horrified. And then he saw, uh, for example, the a mass whipping of about 1,200 people in a small town. He thought this was dreadful. He saw the raping of particularly Jewish women. And he thought this was absolutely awful. And he saw that this was the work really of the SS. And he started to write memoranda to, uh, to higher up, to officials and saying, this is, this is just terrible. This is not the way the Wehrmacht uh, should behave. And Walter von Brauschitz uh, takes one of his memoranda in which he said, he wrote about 50 of them, I think, and he, he sends one uh, to Brauschitz, and Brauschitz sends it to Hitler. And Hitler just you know, purple in the face, eyes bulging, jumping up and down, sort of Hitler fury rage, and says he's uh, naive and this is uncalled for, and he says that he's just basically an employee of the Salvation Army. Um, didn't know that Hitler knew what the Salvation Army was, but nevertheless, um, he's relieved of his command. And he's not, but he's not um, punished, he's not you know, sent to prison or anything like that. And in fact, as the war goes on, of course, he's not promoted uh, until 1944. And in, in the end, he ends the war as um, CNC of, of the Netherlands. And he actually signs the document on, let me just check, the uh, 5th of May, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in the Chief of the Netherlands with Lieutenant Charles Faulkner of the Canadian Army, with Prince Bernard in attendance. Uh, so in other words, he's, a, he's a, a general who had a conscience, who spoke his mind, had the guts to, to speak directly to his um, higher-ups and with this news going to Hitler. And yet, although he was demoted and he didn't do as well as maybe, he, maybe some of his fellow generals, he still ended the war you know, in, in, in command. And so the interesting thing about him is that is, is also his death because um, the SS hated him because he wrote down names in these memorandums, said these crimes have been committed and so on. And he was uh, indicted in Nuremberg and he was in going into the officer's trials in 1948. Uh, and he uh, mysteriously committed suicide, i.e., was thrown off or fell off the high balcony inside the Nuremberg court, for any of you who've been there, uh, into the court, courtyard, the internal courtyard. 
And there was always suspicion that perhaps he had been uh, murdered by the SS, who, who despised him, because um, he, he actually was going to be acquitted. He was not charged with anything. And even uh, after his death, his, his sentences were, were quashed. So he's a very, very interesting, very complex figure. Uh, and I think I, c I count him as one of, if you will, one of Hitler's great generals because of those layers of complexity, because he had the courage uh, to stand up against, uh, f effectively against Hitler and the SS crimes. So uh, one of the things that's interesting about him, though, is that he did not write an autobiography for obvious reasons. I mean, he wasn't around anymore. And, uh, and so very few people have heard of him. And it's one of the things that Bernard and I were talking about was, well, how do we know if there are great generals? And one of the ways that we know about them is because the ones that we have heard about have very often written about themselves in glowing terms. And Bernard has a few things to say about that. So we have a German <laughs> proverb, and it's Wer schreibt, der bleibt. Who writes, stays. And you can, uh, I made on my video on the best journals, I made a social experiment. I said in the very beginning, please write in the comments which channel you think is the best one. And lots of the names are Guderian, Manstein, and Balk. All of them have written autobiographies. One exception is Rommel, and we come to him later. But generally, you see that, yeah, if there was a book about it, and it's a good title, for instance, if you look at Guderian, English title, Panzerlieder, really good marketing title. German title, Erinnerungen eines Soldaten, <laughs> Memoirs of a Soldier. So <laughs> typical German, not that good at marketing, but it's still, still sold well. And if you look at particularly Guderian, I think the recent research from Pöhlmann and others is not, has not been translated yet in English. And if you look at Kursk, for the Battle of Kursk, Guderian mentions, oh, I tried to convince Hitler that's a bad idea and everything else. There's just one major problem. According to Pöhlmann, he found no evidence that Guderian was opposed to Kursk, to the Battle of Kursk or Operation Zitadelle at that point. He finds minor discussion on tactical and other issues, but he has no ev there's no, nothing in the documents that clearly states Guderian was against it. Now one could say, okay, Perlman is maybe biased against Guderian, but he makes also the point that actually at this point, because it was in spring 1943, that Guderian got back on the stage because he was sacked in winter 1941-42, and he became the general inspector of the Panzertruppen. And so actually at that point, when he comes back into power and fray, Everything is already in preparation, so actually he making this point in his biography doesn't make too much sense, because he could just wrote, well, I, I was too late for that. So this also seems quite interesting. There might be something in the documents we haven't found yet, because this always happens that something new turns up, but as far as we know, nothing hints to that, and there are other ma major problems with Guderian's biography as well. So. The same is like with Manstein, with his lost victories for Lorene Siege. And this is, I think, where I give over to you again about the whole business of the historical division and what the German channels did after the war. Well, well speaking of titles, lost victories is a, is a yeah. classic. You know, We won, but we, well, we didn't really, well, we sort of won. Actually, we would have won if it wasn't for Hitler. Because we were really good. And, uh, and yes, Manstein, I think, is the... Is the, is the Doyen of uh, rewriting history, but this, all these myths uh, of the of the good Wehrmacht and, and of these generals, some of whom we've mentioned, really begin actually already at the Nuremberg trials, where you have a situation where um, Franz Halder and other Wehrmacht uh, leaders um, start, you know, really petitioning to clean up the name of the of the Wehrmacht. Now the Wehrmacht have been involved in. They're not the SS, but they've been involved in either bystanders or participating or, or things like the, the mass murder of Soviet prisoners of war, uh, 3.2 million or whatever the number, final number is, uh, who were murdered. And this was a Wehrmacht crime. A lot of the crimes committed going into Poland were, were absolute Wehrmacht crimes. They had nothing to do with the SS, despite Blaskowitz's uh, um, uh, uh, statements and so on. And so um, th uh, the trials that they are held in Nuremberg already begin this, uh, this attempt at rehabilitation, particularly un under Franz Halder. And they, the, the Franz Halder and other leaders get together and they write this, this memorandum of the German generals from 1920 to 1945. It's basically kind of a whole 
re-whitewashing, rewriting the history of, of, uh, of, the, of the Wehrmacht, which is extraordinary. And the whole idea behind it is to exculpate uh, uh, Wehrmacht crimes. And, and this carries on in, in West Germany as the Cold War uh, heats up. And all of a sudden, it, it becomes very clear to the West that we want a strong West Germany. Obviously, Germany is not going to be unified. The Soviet Union is now our great threat. Uh, and these military guys might be quite useful. One of the turning points is the Korean War, when all of a sudden, you know, Adenauer and others, and of course, the Americans and the Brits start saying, well, you know, actually, we, we really need, need to create a Bundeswehr, a West German army. And who can we look to? Well, we can look to these uh, Wehrmacht guys, oops, Wehrmacht guys committed crimes. No, no, they didn't, because we've got all this proof that, they, that that's absolutely untrue. 1950, uh, West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer met at a place called um, Himmerod Abbey with former officers, and they created the Himmerod Memorandum, in which he, they outline what has to happen to clean up the Wehrmacht so that all these generals and, and other officers and so on can actually function in the Bundeswehr without any problems whatsoever. So one of the things they say is that you have to uh, cease for the, the uh, uh, defamation of the German soldier must cease and foreign public uh, opinion of the Wehrmacht must be transformed um, and war criminals must be released for example and all these other stipulations. Americans particularly under Eisenhower thought this was absolutely fine. Formerly of course he'd seen the Wehrmacht as Nazis, a sort of blanket a term that he used to describe them. If you're talking, if you read what he says in 1945, for example, but by 1950, everything's changed and Eisenhower is very much, you know, with uh, Adenauer on this to try and re recreate this, uh, this new path. And for example, we British um, also very much said, okay, we're going to stop uh, the, the war crimes trials. That's, that's not going to happen any, any longer. Then uh, the, uh, the next state stage was that, well, there was something called the Hankey Lobby in Britain, which was also very much behind this. People like Winston Churchill and, and uh, Little Hart and, uh, and uh, others started to, to really lobby to, to change, and, and some of the uh, German generals who, who um, were, were going to be imprisoned or were uh, under investigation uh, were, were lobbied by people like Churchill, in fact, who said, no, 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 they weren't so bad. Um, and then, of course, a, a, a Halder went to work for the U.S. Army Historical Division uh, in Washington, and he had about 700 uh, generals and other officers write their memoirs, but they were all given not to the Americans, but to him, and he edited all of them. So, in other words, all of the sorts of things you know, that, had, that implicated the Wehrmacht uh, particularly this was all to do with the Eastern Front, was all erased. And so scholars used those uh, memoirs in the 60s, 50s and 60s, um, thinking that they were genuine, the genuine article. Um, this myth has very much been debunked, uh, starting in really in the 1980s, 1990s, when a lot of research was done showing that the Wehrmacht uh, was indeed culpable in many of these crimes. Uh, and so this, this sort of the whole thing was reversed, but you know, it was useful for the Cold War to have these officers and generals you know, uh, appearing to be sort of lily white, absolutely perfect and uh, free of any, any uh, connection with these, with these crimes. Um, the real turning point, I suppose, was finally in 1995 when, when some historians and the, the Hamburg Institute for Social Research uh, produced uh, an exhibition and, and um, documentation showing, uh, for example, graphic photographs of about 1,200 Wehrmacht crimes and, and other things, which, which, which really started to change people's, people's minds. But nevertheless, it, it's taken a very long time, and this is one of the reasons that some of the generals whose names you can all probably list, um, and who's, who, who were in many cases um, glorified in the West after the war, are now coming into question, and their actual careers are being questioned uh, much more. And I think that um, you had a certain general in mind uh, that you wanted to talk about. So, uh, I mean, we're in Great Britain, so we kind of have to talk about Erwin Rommel. So, probably, I, I make the distinction between Erwin Rommel and the Desert Fox. I think the Desert Fox is the myth that everyone wants, and there's Erwin Rommel. And I think we know a lot about the Desert Fox, or we think to know a lot, and we know very less about Erwin Rommel. Now, if you look at the initial, initial point of military effectiveness by the Germans, they said, okay, the most amount of damage to the enemy, but the least amount of losses. Now, if we look, when Rommel in the Second World War first takes command, it's of the 7th Panzer Division, also sometimes called Ghost Division, in the Battle of France. And one German military historian, Colonel Groß, and he made the point that 
Rommel led his division like a company. Now, to put this in perspective, a company is about 150 to 250 people. A Panzer division at that point is at least 10,000 people or more to between 10 to 15,000, depending if some units are attached or not. So you see quite a difference. Of course, one could say Colonel Gross never was in a war involved, so maybe, maybe this is just bad mouthing or something else. But the interesting thing is, I found an infographic in the German military archives about the losses of the Panzer divisions in Poland and in France, and the 7th Panzer Division for France has the highest losses of all the Panzer divisions. Of course, this is not proof at all, because we would have to look at what they engaged, how many damage they inflicted, because when Rob Roman broke through at the near the Marginal line on the edges, he basically, Gross also notes, he overrode, no, Freezer, sorry, noted he basically overrode the whole uh, um, French division during its sleep, and uh, a lot of prisons of war were, uh, were made and everything else. The other thing is, of course, as you might know, there was the counterattack by the British forces at Arras, and uh, they also faced the Matilda II tank, which was pretty strong and could could not basically destroy it by German tanks. So they had usually bring in the 88 millimeter gun or engineers or something else. So it was quite complicated. So we would have to look closer if these losses that are the highest for the 7th Panzer Division were maybe because Rommel led the wrong way or because he faced major opposition or achieved more. So that is one way where we could look at this. Now, the other question with Rommel is, because he's generally portrayed as this non-political and very clean general, which to a certain degree is correct, but once you just look a little bit, you realize what was Rommel doing in the beginning of the war and before the war? He was assigned to the bodyguard detachment of Hitler. Now, some will go, wait, because I got a comment on, the, on YouTube once, but Hitler, uh, but Rommel was never in the SS, and the SS was there to protect Hitler. Well, Hitler was the chancellor, he was the commander, and everything else. So there were several bodyguard detachments all over the place, and some became later units in the war and everything. So it's quite complicated. So Rommel was in, in charge of the army detachment, or Wehrmacht detachment, that protected him. And why is this important? Well, Rommel in the First World War was a very successful infantry commander, and he received the Pour le Marie, the highest Prussian um, mi military uh, order, and so he was already famous. But he was with the mountain troops, and then he gets in command of a panzer division, of which the Germans had around 10 at that point. Well, maybe something happened with Hitler, because Hitler was very fond of Rommel, and Rommel was very fond of Hitler. This, of course, also to a certain degree explains some of the bad-mouthing Rommel receives from the other German generals, because they're envious. But you already see the problem here. A lot of very different people that note, ah, Rommel it was bad, he had no idea about logistics. I think Peter Lieb made the point that I think Halder stated this, or Brauchitsch, <laughs> and then he said, well, but Halder and Brauchitsch were not particularly good on logistics either. So it gets always complicated, and the question is, which I ask in my video, is there generally enough information available on all this? Can we make this judgment and look at all the information that is out there? And this is my general problem, because if you look at the Wehrmacht, when I started my channel in 2016, I assumed the Wehrmacht as well well researched, and well, I found out over the years that usually when I start talking to German military historians like Jens or Chris, then we have more questions after we do a talk on video than we had before. There's one when we talked about, I think, Beutewaffen, so captured weapons, and if you look at there's no academic study or I think any study on how the Germans actually used captured weapons. What was the concept? We know they used them, but what was, was it from the top? Was it bottom up? Was it something in between? I found some tidbits now in the archives and somewhere else, but there's no real study on this. Meanwhile, you see plenty of books on Beutepanzer, Beutewaffen, and everything else. But the Wehrmacht in general is like, everyone talks about the Wehrmacht, but in the end, we know very little that is really fundamental about the Wehrmacht, and especially with the generals, because I mean, Hürter's study was on 25 generals from summer 1941 to summer 1942. 
And in total, the Wehrmacht had more than 3,000 generals. And if we just take the army generals, we only have around 900. And we don't even have biographies, I think, for 90 generals. So this is also why I generally have a problem with this question at all, because it's like, yeah, you're staring in the abyss and try to answer a very specific, extremely complicated question with a lot of nuances and a lot of problems to deal with. How do, you, how do you explain the lack of knowledge? Is this to do with a sort of post-war not wanting to really go into this subject too deeply, or what's the, what's the reason for this? Well, there is, there's different reasons. So first off, for in, the, in the very beginning, all, a lot of the documents were captured by the Allies, and they were, I think, returned in the 60s, 70s around. So before, you couldn't really do proper research at all, or, or very limited. The, you see early stuff, and they usually if they have their documents in private. And then the general academic research is very limited and it was mostly focused for a long time, it was focused on war crimes. And also German military story looks also more on cultural aspects and structure. Of course, also very limited. And if, if you look at the re US Army Green Books, they were done right after the war. I think there are a few hundred volumes. Yes. So Germany has the semi-official history, the Deutsche Reich and the Zweite Weltkrieg, in, Germ in English, the Germany and the Second World War which has 10 volumes, but some have two parts, like five, nine, and 10. So I think in total it's 15. And I think up to part eight, volume eight, they were translated into English. They started in, in late 1970s and finished about, I think, 2010, 2015 or something. So it took them more than 20 years. And these are just 15 volumes, and they, of course, can't deal in any detail with anything else. There's, I, I looked some stuff up, it's basically mis uh, like the Reshef, the, the, uh, the, the, the several battles of Reshef, they make up a few pages. Uh, I think the Winter War the finish is, is basically just mentioned. Mm -hmm. so, and, and of course, when they were finished, everything was all outdated from the very first volumes already because it started in the, uh, early se uh, in the late 70s. And then there was, of course, the short, uh, the, the Russian archives were open for a short time. And also to a certain degree, the, if you do too much military stuff in Germany and Austria and not enough on the war crime side, or other, you, you get some suspicious looks <laughs> generally and it's, it's a bit problematic. So, this is also, and, and then there's, I mean, there's generally the point, for instance, there's almost no operational history. I think the, the last, or there's one academic work on the Battle of the Bush, and it's from, I think it was started in the 70s as a PhD and finished, and then it was published as a book in the 80s or something. So this is the Battle of the Bush, and for instance, it's particularly interesting if you look at D-Day. There is Peter Lieb did uh, one popular work and one, one really in-depth study. And I think there are two or three more, but that's it. And if you look at DD on the American or British side, yeah. you, you, you look... <laughs> it's like a mountain, <laughs> yeah. An overwhelming amount of books. So yeah. in some cases we have... I guess there are some speakers here who wrote, wrote more books on D-Day than the German academics wrote on D-Day together. <laughs> so do, uh, do German and Austrian scholars use the English works, or is there just not that much interest? Uh, I didn't look too much at the bibliographies. I think Peter Lieb uh, certainly did. He, I think he, he was a lecturer at Sandhurst, but I remember, for instance, that I think Glantz was, which he's the American expert on, the Eastern Front didn't show up too much in some of the books. It, it depends also on the author and the generation and everything else. There's also some shift happening because you look at certain new works and you see suddenly, okay, the more or less this, the, the predecessor in the same, in the same uh, institute or something. So there's also the, the generational shift. One, one historian told me, so what is your age? And I said, yeah, I'm around 40. And I said, yeah, like me. And then he said, we are the first generation that was not directly connected to the war. The first generation where they were directly involved in the war, and the second generation where the fathers was in, um, were in the war. And for us, it's the grandfathers, so we have enough distance already, then we can have a bit of a more relaxed look at mm -hmm. the whole aspects. Yeah. So you think that the interest is going to grow over the years rather 
Well, I think officially now the, the main research for military history is done by the Bundeswehr, by the ZMS, previously the MGFR. And I think they moved on from the Second World War and go now more po uh, into the Cold War and Afghanistan and mm -hmm. everything else. So mm, not so much. It's, it's not looking very pretty. I mean, Chris and I try to stem <laughs> the tide a bit, but. <laughs> so we were talking earlier about, about the great generals, but the difference between the way in which the generals who functioned in the East were seen as, as opposed to those who functioned in the West or those who, who were in both places. What can you say about that and that dynamism or the way in which they're interpreted? I mean, it was generally the, the, the few point, at least from some of the Eastern Front, that the Eastern Front, I mean, this was always the main area of, of the German army. Everything else was a Nebenkriegsschauplatz, a, a sideshow, basically. So there was Africa, was a sideshow, there was the Western Front, as a sideshow. And there's actually, I found one, in one document, very interesting, there were some volunteers from the Eastern Front that went to Africa. And, and, and the, the people from the Africa Corps complained like they thought this would be like holiday or something. And, and actually they're having real troubles now, but they, as, but they as stated probably these tries tried to escape from the Eastern Front in a way and thought it would be really nice. And the, the other major difference is in shortly after the invasion in Normandy, one general was sent over because Rommel and the others were writing reports and they were all very negative and they were and then the, the German high command and others said, ah yeah, you're defeatist, a uh, defeatist, or I, I sorry, I don't know the word exactly. And you're all negative and, and pessimistic. Let's send somebody from the Eastern Front there. So this general shows up and the first thing he wants to do is take his uh, biplane or his fuselage ashore, it's not, not a biplane, take his plane to the front line like he does on the Eastern Front. And the people tell him, that's not a good idea. You know, there's <laughs> air supremacy here in a way. And then he reluctantly agrees and he takes his car. And I think it takes him a half a day or something because he constantly gets attacked by fighter bombers, even in his car. And then he, it, he really has like the epiphany, okay, this is really very different. And Rommel warned them about this before. But Rommel was also, for instance, if you look at Rommel, he was like about Italy, he was very pessimistic. And then I think Kesselring basically then showed, okay, actually we can hold way longer than we thought. So there's always the, these different opinions and assessments and one has to look really close because it's, it's sometimes hard to tell. And I think this is what it comes down to the end. It's complicated. And this is probably <laughs> why you invited some Germans <laughs> and Austrians over here. <laughs> You talked a bit about uh, Guderian, about Manstein. Uh, one of the things that Manstein, of course, self-aggrandizement in uh, his um, you know, lost victories was about the Third Battle of Kharkov, where he, he claims that the, the Germans were outnumbered four to one on the Eastern Front, but he was outnumbered eight to one on the Eastern Front. What can you say about the sort of manipulation of these sorts of figures and, and battles and, and how these generals, their self-perception, their self-presentation has affected the way in which they're seen now? So generally there's the problem with these numbers that how you count. For instance, um, Wettstein, who is the German, or Swiss expert on, on urban combat of the Wehrmacht, he looked at the numbers for Stalingrad and the numbers from Glantz, and he noted that Glantz, uh, Glantz puts down the numbers from the German division, oh no, no, writes them up basically, because he assumes they're the full strength, which was generally not the case. The other thing is if you compare them, Soviet divisions generally had a lot of their logistics outside, they were not organic to the divisions. Meanwhile, the German divisions usually had their logistics organically. And then you, you have the, the army journal troops, I think they're called in English, the Heerestruppen, which are sometimes not counted or differently. So comparing these numbers is pretty hard. From what I know from military intelligence, the Germans had a very good picture on the tactical level, so what, what divisions they were facing. But once it got like 10 or 20 kilometers behind the front lines, just question marks, because then the military intelligence was really yeah, Fremde Herre Ost, Foreign Armies East wa was not very effective in this way. So the numbers could be correct, they could be incorrect. Then there's also the aspect of, of putting a Schwerpunkt or temporarily, like for instance, the Luftwaffe on the Eastern Front generally mentioned, uh, um, was able even in 1945 sometimes to achieve temporary air superiority, just for a few hours or something. Mm. 
On the Western Front, this was generally not possible at that point or at all. And you could also say, yeah, well, the, if the spearheads from the Soviets came in at one point, and what part do you look at the front line? Maybe it's true if you look at the front line when the Soviets all lined up the Red Army f to break through, and the Germans haven't moved the troops into counter for a counterattack or prepared something. So it could be true. Again, it's complicated. And one had to look at, uh, at the Soviet documents and the German documents. But one problem is also if you look at the uh, uh, German losses and their assessment, they know that even their own loss statistics are incorrect to a certain degree. Yeah. And not intentionally. They are like, we're missing a few people. This is why um, Obermanns did a study on this and, and tried to find it out with statistical <laughs> methods. And you have the same also with, with, with Soviet sources, for instance, there's also the problem, like some people say everyone lies in their sources, but I think there was one, one study on partisan warfare, and they looked at the German claims on sabotage, and they, the numbers stay the same. But then, they, uh, and then for the Soviet side, the higher the level goes, the numbers increase. So the success is the, the point, of course, then the author notes they had probably an incentive to give higher numbers, whereas the Germans, to report how much was damaged, they had little incentive to change the numbers because they needed still the material. And at the same time, if they make a, a larger numbers, they say you are ineffective in suppressing the partisans. So you could also argue they had no incentive, so and maybe in other cases they had an incentive. Uh, the same goes for, for the tank kills. Fremde Herr Ost, I think in 1943, noted all the tank kills we get, we get reported from, from the troops, we have to discount by 50%. So some denote some parts is because over-reporting from the kills, which happens by accident or enthusiastic troops. But then I think they made five or six or seven points to, to explain, well, the Soviets will get way better in repairing and maintaining the tanks, so the, num the numbers that can get replaced get put up and everything else. The funny thing is with this document, because I talked with Jens about it, and he says, I know Soviet reports and maintenance and everything, and they are not that good at that point. And so we don't know if Fremde Herre Ost in this document wrote down what they really thought, why the, the numbers should be discounted by 50%, or if they couldn't say, yeah, we don't trust the guys at the front. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. It could be both, or even a mixture. Because it's, it's not valid now that you be honest in the Wehrmacht and, and, and other points. Whereas I think it was Williams Murray, and he noted, for instance, for Poland, but that was still a different time, that the German army was very critical about the performance in Poland. And he made, I think, remarks to his service later in the US Army, I think, a post war. And he said, there was the, it's common, the higher the uh, report gets, the more the more flavor or the more nice it gets, whereas he doesn't see this in the German reports. But that was for Poland, and I haven't read the reports myself, so I can only stand by his word by now. And there's also, of course, also a different culture as well. So I think Germans and Austria are generally more direct in a way, and I think this was back then the same, but at one point there was also a change to a certain degree, of course. So just coming back to these sort of big questions about the generals, like how important or the generals. I mean, no, you don't want to. You don't want to go into the sort of details of one specific general or another. But how important is is that figure in battles? And are generals, for example, the Germans, known largely because of the battles that they won or were involved in, rather than that they were competent or other measures of their skill level? I'm, I mean, Hürder argues in his book that the German generals had mostly an influence on the tactical level, and even sometimes on the operational level, it was limited because mostly was coming from the, from the German army high command and also from Hitler in a certain, which was of course there. And that they had very limited chances. And he, I think he mo makes also one point that at one point when they had the choice that sometimes it did, didn't even work out. I think he mentions Fedor von Bock and, and the offensive against Moscow. And I think it really depends on what you look. If you look at the history of a corps, then of course the corps commander is really important. If you look at the whole level, like with the Sixth Army and breaking out of Stalingrad, there you see the inertia of the whole system, as I initially described, and also 
the breakout at Stalingrad would have been a major problem because the logistical situation was already really bad before they were encircled. So after the encirclement, it's even worse. So from what Hürter wrote, it, it looked like mostly their influence was very limited and they were basically reduced technicians. And this was in contrast to how they were before the war or bef in, the, in the other conflicts because they have more influence. But if you look at the Battle of France, for instance, there it seems that the current research is basically, well, the mo many of the panzer generals basically went rogue and they pulled the whole army with them. Mm -hmm. So this is also, again, I it's complicated of what you look. I've just been told that's it because the tent apparently has to be cleared out immediately for another speaker. So I'm extremely sorry, but thank you so much, Bernard, for coming thank to you. to talk to us about this amazing subject.